to the yeah. there we go. <laughs> uh, welcome everyone to the uh, QLS seminar. Uh, my name is Shale, and it's my pleasure to introduce today Professor Alex Baldwin, uh, who is an assistant professor affiliated with the ophthalmology department, visual sciences research, um, the RIMUHD QLS, and the IPN, focusing on studying visual perception through uh, psychophysics. He did his PhD at Aston University, which I found out is in Birmingham, focusing largely on what we'll be hearing more about today, which is summation models of contrast sensitivity. Um, he has continued that work as well as shifting to binocular perception and disorders like amblyopia. So today he's going to be telling us about those summation models for contrast sensitivity in human vision. And it is my honor to welcome him to speak to us. So you could join me in welcoming him. That's great. Thank you very much. So you already stepped on my first slide a little bit because I didn't know that I was going to get a, an introduction. Uh, so three quarters of that is, is uh, eaten up. Um, so one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about these uh, contrast summation models today is because, I mean, I know that you're all from quite wide backgrounds. And so most of you probably have no research experience with vision. If you do, probably not with psychophysics or with this kind of modeling. But the good thing about these kind of models is they're relatively straightforward and intuitive to understand why, why we're doing it, like what we want to understand and the way that we're trying to understand it. And also, I mean, I think it's relatively fun. So we're going to find out if it's fun together as well. So just as for in terms of an outline of what I'm going to talk about, the first part's really going to be sort of setting up the question. So how are contrast signals combined over space and how do we look at that? I'm going to spend maybe the first half looking at, um, at setting and framing that question. And then in the second half, we're gonna talk about the actual sort of um, empirical research findings. Um, and that's to say that this combination that occurs is extensive, that it follows roughly the same combination rule across the central visual field. And um, the argument that the signals are being added together and not just selected. Oh, yes. Oh, good idea. Hold on a second. Yes. Okay, so when we're talking about, say, a psychophysical task, actually, can I get rid of this green thing as well? Yeah, I can. Okay. So um, when we're talking about a most basic psychophysical task, um, that would be sort of detection of a low contrast target. So contrast, obviously, is the variation in luminance over space. So we could give a metric of that as sort of the difference between the maximum and minimum luminance in a pattern divided by the, the sum of the max and the min. So it's just, you know, how, how much variation is there in luminance? So next slide, there we go. So we might do an experiment like this one here where we'd have some look at a display. They'd be fixating on the little uh, mini circle in the middle there, which you can see, if you see my mouse, yep. Yeah. They'd be fixated in this little mini circle, and then we'd say, on which side is this little stripy target? So here, obviously, it's on the right. Here, I'm sure you can probably still see it. Anybody wants to yell out which side they see it on? On the left, great. And then here, it might be hard to see. Can anybody? On the right, perfect. So, oh, I didn't mean to put that animation there. But um, when we do this kind of experiment, what we measure is the probability of somebody getting it correct, selecting the right side, as a function of the contrast. Um, and when the contrast is very low, they find it very difficult. So they're guessing, you know, 50%, you have a 50-50 chance, so you're guessing. Contrast is very high, you reach this saturated maximum performance of around 100%. And then in the middle, you're somewhere in between guessing and being able to do it. Um, and the important thing about visual performance is that it's stochastic, right? So when you're in the middle of this range, there's a probability you're going to be correct on each trial, but you're not definitely correct on each trial. So where this variation comes from under signal detection theory um, is that you have a noisy response, for instance, here to the middle, you have a noisy response to the target and non-target locations. On average, it's higher at the target location and how much it's larger by at the target location determines how well you perform at the task. So we have a distribution of responses in red here from a target location, in blue from the non-target location. 
and performance is determined by the difference between the two of them and how much of that difference is greater than zero. So on what proportion of the time is the target response greater than the non-target response? And if we do this for different contrasts, which will move the target response to the right, we get the function that we looked at on the previous slide. Happy? So what we wanna know in terms of contrast summation is how does our performance on a task like the one I just showed you depend on the size of the target? And if we're gonna come up with a model of that, what we wanna know is what function is it that maps the, us from a stimulus image to what that response might be. Um, and when the response is stochastic, you can either work out the statistics of that response analytically. So if you understand what the function is, you can work out what the response should be and how it should vary. Or you can use sort of Monte Carlo simulation methods to sort of do it on a, on a simulated basis. The reason why we'd wanna look at changes in performance with area or summation um, is that it will tell us something about how this response is being combined together, about what this function is that's mapping the stimulus to the response. And so that's telling us something uh, about how the visual system might process the input that it gets. Um, just a quick aside about, um, we, we looked at sort of gratings there, those stripy patterns. Um, people originally looked at this in terms of um, sort of bright blobs because some of the early interest in visual performance came from astronomy where people were interested in you know, how well we can see um, stars. Um, sort of bright blobs have their own sort of rules which are related, but we're looking in this case at these sort of grating sort of stripy stimuli, which are um, for people who are, you know, have an interest in, in vision, we like to use these because they have a specific spatial frequency. So how wide the bars are and a specific orientation. So in this case, they are horizontal. We can also think about other kinds of summation that I'm not gonna talk about today, which is summation between the two eyes. So using two eyes to see something is generally better than using one eye. And then you can look at how much binocular summation we have. Um, summation between different spatial channels. Um, so between overlapping stimuli of different orientations. And of course, summation over time, like how looking at something for longer makes it easier to see as well. So here's the kind of thing that we expect to see. Um, on the x-axis of this plot here, we have area and it's area plotted as uh, 20 times the base 10 log of the area. The reason why we do this weird transformation on it is because it makes it in the same sort of units, uh, decibels as the contrast threshold. Um, so in the case of a linear summation, what that means is that every time we double the size, so a six dB step here is a doubling. Every time we double the size with linear summation, we half the threshold. So it's as if we've got the same amount of contrast, but we've sort of spread it around twice the area. Um, you can get less summation. So in the quadratic case, threshold is gonna decrease in proportion to the square root of the area, which is gonna look like this, so a slope of a half on this double log plot. And then we have this fourth root summation as well, which has a half the slope even of that. So obviously the, the question, well, before I move on, everybody happy with this part? Yeah, okay. So then the question is, where can we get these slopes from in terms of you know, mechanistically? Uh, so the way that we think about this is the visual input is being sampled by these local mechanisms. So these are thought to be analogous to sort of, uh, you know, V1, you know, primary visual cortex receptive fields, or that's sort of our, you know, rough approximation to the electrophysiology of things, um, that, that the input is being sampled at each location in space, and that at each location in space, there is some mechanism that gives a response, and the response is based on the contrast at that location. So we can think about it like this, where we've taken the grating stimuli, and now where things are more yellow, we have a stronger response, and where things are more purple, the response is less, and that we have a response where there is uh, where there is something in the stimulus where the grating is present. So the idea for signal detection theory is that this response is noisy and that this noise is what limits our performance. So we're modeling this noise. Uh, I'm gonna talk about it today just as an additive Gaussian noise. There are other kinds of noise that you could also uh, consider um, and that it's uncorrelated between these different spatial 
locations and also over time. So here, there's sort of a, a shift from thinking about the experiment as a stimuli on the left and on the right and saying, which side do you see it on? Instead, now we're thinking about two moments in time. So there were maybe two beeps and in time with one of the two beeps, there is a stimulus that's there that's the target. And you have to say, did I see the target on the first beep or in time with the second beep? And it lets us show things at the same location in space because the stimuli are gonna get very large. We can't show them next to each other when they're very big. Now, if we wanted to get the best performance as the visual system here, what we should be doing is combining or adding together the information from all of the relevant mechanisms. So from all of the uh, relevant locations where there can be signal, we should be combining together the signal from those locations and ignoring it from all those irrelevant locations that are only adding noise. On the other hand, you can have a probability summation model um, and that proposes that the response is driven by just the single one most active mechanism on each trial. So all that we care about is where, where did we get our single peak strongest response? You know, which side was that on in the first experiment or on this experiment where it's in time instead? Was that in time with the first beep or the second beep that we got our single highest response? And that would be the probability summation account, which was a, an earlier version of that was the sort of dominant model of uh, summation for maybe uh, 25, uh, 30 years or so. So um, as this is, you know, QLS, I think we're supposed to get into, you know, the, the details and, and uh, th thankfully these models are pretty, um, are going to be quite simple. So um, I imagine you're all going to be able to keep up like absolutely no problem. Um, so uh, the, um, in each mechanism, we have a response to the stimulus as well as some variability. Um, and the threshold that we have, so the smallest contrast at which we can still see the target is going to be inversely proportional to the um, overall signal to noise ratio of, of the, the stimulus. So our predictions are going to depend on how the magnitude of the signal and the noise change as the target gets bigger. So really the same, like I said, super simple. Um, if we always monitor the entire display, then the accumulated noise, the variability is gonna be constant. Um, regardless of the stimulus size, we're getting the noise from every single location. So all that increasing the area does is of the stimulus is add more signal carrying inputs. Um, and it, so we have this basic equation at the bottom, signal to noise ratio is gonna be the contrast times the number of signal carrying inputs, which is we're gonna see is just N here. Um, divided by whatever the total noise is. So um, it's all, oh, where's my mouse gone? There we go. Um, so all of these are just equal to one, um, or sorry, and so this is equal to N. Signal to noise ratio is N times the contrast divided by the total noise. Um, the threshold is proportional to one over the number of um, mechanisms or one over the area of the stimulus. So this is that linear slope of minus one. Obviously, you'd say it's proportional here. If we worked out what uh, sigma was, then we could find out the overall, what the thresholds actually are. But all we're interested in here is just what's the slope? How quickly is it going down? Everybody happy? I think so, yeah. Okay, so you can have a similar model, but instead of the response to contrast being a linear response to contrast, you could have a nonlinear response to contrast. Um, so that's where you have a, some transducer. Um, importantly, it has to be before the limiting noise source happens. Um, and um, in that, this case, the summation just depends on whatever the exponent is of that transducer. So very similar to what we had before, but now it's contrast to the power M. So this works out as if M was two, which is very often we think it is, then the threshold is proportional to one over the square root of N. That's that second slope. You can get the same outcome, this one over square root of n, if instead there is some, we call it, you know, a template. So the participant is able to ignore the irrelevant regions in the display. So they are only accumulating noise within the bound of the stimulus. And this template grows as the stimulus grows, but they know which mechanisms to monitor and which mechanisms to ignore each time. Um, in this case, because the noise is growing in proportion to the square root of the area, 
then threshold is proportional to one over square root of n. And you can have combinations as well. So before I get to probability summation, you can combine together a nonlinear transducer with a, a template, and then you can get the combination of the two, which would be the, the fourth root. So that's simple for, for additive summation. In probability summation, it's more complex because we aren't adding together the responses. Instead, we're looking at that single maximum response and asking which interval did it happen in or which location in space is it associated with. So um, what we have there, this is it's been worked out a few different ways, um, either through approximations or through simulations. This um, I published with um, uh, Fred Kingdom and Gunnar Schmidtman a few years ago. Um, it looks more ugly, but it's actually pretty simple. Um, it's just the probability of choosing the right side is just for each mechanism that contains the target. And for any value it can have, the probability of it having that value, given the contrast and the amount of noise we have, um, multiplied by the probability that all of the other locations in the stimulus on the signal presentation have a smaller value and the probability that um, all of the locations in the null, non-target non stimulus have a smaller value. So uh, it looks ugly, but it's actually quite simple. Um, and, but the, so you can work this out. And what we find out is that, oops, it's gone forward. What we find out is that the threshold is roughly proportional to one over the fourth root of n also here, which is nice and simple, but it's kind of bad news because it's the same as the combination of the, um, nonlinear transducer and the uh, template. You can also add the other parts to this. So if you give it a nonlinear transducer with an exponent of two, then it becomes one over the eighth root of n. People happy? Yeah, okay. Is it sensitive to your normal assumptions there? Uh, of the, the fact that the noise is normal, yes. It's yeah. so it, all, all the regular assumptions are baked into it. Obviously we could make a different version of the, this, you know, we could formulate a different version of it for different kinds of noise. Um, in the paper, we have it for um, uh, different sort of weightings of signal. So this is just for if the signal is constant within the target region as well. Um, what's neat about this formulation is because it predicts the probability of being correct, it doesn't just predict that summation slope, it also predicts the um, expected performance on each trial. So it's fit in the uh, likelihood space rather than being fit in threshold space. Um, the additive summation models can also be easily worked out um, for the same thing. And it gives you a bit more power to fit things, obviously, in likelihood space rather than getting thresholds and then fitting thresholds. Um, it also theoretically would let us try and find uh, most optimal methods for distinguishing between the two of them where there are differences. But uh, um, it's those sorts of things are better handled by coming up with different designs rather than trying to find very small quantitative differences. Okay, so for the different model slopes I talked about so far, we can see that they fall into the categories of what um, I showed at the beginning, um, almost as if it was planned. So we have the uh, linear, quadratic and fourth root, where linear summation gives us that linear slope Quadratic summation can either be because of this squaring transducer or because of a template. And fourth root summation either comes from this combination of squaring and, and templating or from probability summation. Um, obviously we can find slopes other than these slopes, um, but uh, I mean, anyone's in between, especially with a nonlinear transducer, you can get anywhere. But uh, these are the sort of canonical often considered slopes. So the question then is what we see actually sort of empirically, which is more like this. So here's some example data from a study I put out, uh, I'd like to say a few years ago, <laughs> times really times flown, um, where we measured threshold as a, a function of a, a grating area. And obviously what comes out of this is that the summation doesn't follow a single rule. So for larger sizes, definitely, we see that the decline in threshold gets less. You know, at least for some region, it looks kind of fourth rootish, And then as we get larger, it becomes less than that. Um, there's an obvious explanation for that, which is that as we make this stimulus larger, 
So it starts off sort of small in the middle and it gets pretty big on the screen. Um, as you go into more and more peripheral regions of the visual field, your sensitivity is less to contrast, right? Your vision is obviously best wherever you're directly looking at. And then as you go away from where you're directly looking, your sensitivity is less. So as we make the stimulus larger and larger, we're showing it to progressively less and less sensitive regions of the visual field. But we can map what that sensitivity decline is, um, which is what we have here. So this is a map that, I think this is a map I measured, which is the average of four people, I think four people. Um, and so if we know what this map is, we can use it to try and find out um, what kind of summation we're really getting. Um, the other way that people did this in previous studies before uh, I measured this map was they would just show things at very large eccentricities. So the sensitivity declines, yes, but if you go out far enough, you can find regions where it's roughly constant. So a study might show a stripe of grating across a region of the visual field where sensitivity isn't varying much. Um, the other thing that you can do to handle these eccentricity problems is look at you know, scaling. So, you know, uh, M scaling, making things larger, but we're interested in what happens in a single pattern, not something that sort of blows up and gets bigger in the visual, in the periphery. The other thing that we see empirically is if you go very small, so this is going at the other end of the scale, um, you also get a much steeper summation for very small sizes. Um, and this also we have an explanation for, which is that over very short ranges, we're gonna expect that different parts of the stimuli are gonna interact linearly. Um, you can imagine that if we have um, a V1 receptive field, like a simple cell, um, here's you know, some uh, data from Hubel and Wiesel back in the late 50s, where they have a, you know, a simple cell, they mapped it out with points of light. And the fact they could map it out with points of light is you know, within, within the receptive field, you can map it out linearly. And if you're showing something that's like a grating within, within that, very small region in space, it's also gonna to sum together linearly in the same way that they were doing with their points of light. Um, and so in the model that I'm gonna show you later on, we have to represent these within filter interactions that are happening inside the footprint of a receptive field. So here's just some more data from a bunch of other previous studies that shows, um, unfortunately, the bar at the top cuts off the, the heading, but on the left here, we have stuff that was done in the fovea, and on the right, we have stuff that was done in the periphery. Um, and you see sort of uh, phobial studies, you get the shallowing off that I mentioned earlier because of the, the decline in sensitivity that happens. And that's not true in the studies in the periphery because there is you know, more, they use regions where it's more constant. And also where there's a tendency for things to be a little bit steeper um, at the beginning, but you know, these studies aren't testing very small stimuli. So to get onto the actual sort of claims or, or findings, um, as I mentioned before, we're gonna talk about the summation being extensive to the point that we don't know if there's an actual limit of how large it goes, um, that it behaves similarly across the central visual field and that signals are being combined over space and not just by probability summation. So hopefully now everybody is on board here and at home on Zoom um, to understand what these three claims are saying. So for the first study I'm going to talk about, it's this two interval force choice detection. So as I described before, one beep, another beep, in time with one of them, there's a grating that's shown of circular four cycle per degree gratings in eight sizes from 1.3 cycles. So 1.3 grating periods in diameter, all the way up to 33 grating periods in diameter. Uh, shown for 100 milliseconds, measuring detection thresholds, using a staircase to vary contrast. So that is when they get it wrong, we make the contrast larger. When they get it right, we make the contrast smaller. Um, importantly, actually, the participant knew the size they were expecting in each sort of sequence of presentations. So they weren't uncertain about how much of the screen the stimulus might occupy, which is a, a manipulation you can do to see whether it matters, whether people are worse if they don't know what size to expect, and then better if they know exactly what size to expect. Um, and then we got the thresholds out using our standard sort of method. The, the novel sort of twist on this study was that we tested both with these sort of, we call them flat uncompensated gratings like we have on the left here. So the contrast of this is just the same across its whole area. 
Um, and then on the right, we have these compensated gratings. And what we've done here is using the, um, the maps that we measured from all of our participants, when this grating is shown at contrast threshold, so when the middle of it is only just detectable and you're looking at the middle, the entire thing is only just detectable. Any point on it is also at the detection threshold. So the idea is that um, it is equally detectable. And so we have factored out that decline in sensitivity that happens across the visual field. And then we try to understand that using um, a bunch of models. This is the a good sort of example model because it has all the parts in it. Um, so in our model, we have the attenuation. So in the case where the stimulus is compensated, like it is on the right here, the attenuation just reverses that compensation and it becomes the flat stimulus again. Um, in the case where we have a non-compensated stimulus, it, after it's attenuated, it's weaker at the edges and it's stronger in the center. Um, in the same way that the sensitivity is stronger in the center and weaker at the edges. We have some spatial filtering using um, these little receptive field uh, models that we take from uh, numbers. We just take a pair of numbers that are we think are representative from the physiology. Um, so after we do the spatial filtering, we have the sort of uh, the, an image of the contrast at each location. Um, this goes through a stage of rectification and transduction. So for this noisy energy model, it's a squaring that happens here. There's an additive Gaussian noise that affects each um, output. There is a template which grabs the part that's the size of our stimulus. And then we have just summation over the whole thing. Obviously, you know, bits of this you could swap out. You could swap the additive summation to a max operator, and then it would be a probability summation model. Uh, you can remove the template. Um, you can change this uh, transducer to be linear, um, or you can uh, mess around with the filters, though it won't make much of a difference. So here's some data that we have over three participants. Um, I should use the mouse so that people can, pointing at the board's not going to help people at home. Um, the, uh, so what, what we have, these gray points are the, the data. So these are the same data I showed earlier on. So they initially decline a bit more steeply and then they shallow out. And in purple here, what is following the data sort of pretty much uh, perfectly is the, this noisy energy model. So we have the steeper part at the beginning that comes from these within filter short range interactions that we would say happen within the footprint of, of the receptive fields. We have the medium region, which is around a fourth root summation. And then we have it compressing together at the end. This is obviously with the uncompensated stimuli. And what we see is this is great for our fourth root noisy energy model. And um, we also plot here a quadratic summation model. So this could be you know, just squaring and no template or just template and no squaring. And we have in green here, a probability summation model, which the reason why it's so shallow is because it has also a nonlinear trend with, with an M of two. So this is sort of eighth root summation. Uh, this is fit by uh, one parameter that just moves everything up and down um, in, in terms of the global sensitivity. And that's the same parameter for both plots. So on the right here is the plot of the compensated data. So here, the beginning looks the same, but then for the larger um, sizes, we no longer have that curling up, that decrease in summation as the stimulus gets larger because we've compensated it. And so it's as if it's a flat stimulus once it gets through. Um, and so we find summation just keeps going. It doesn't seem to shallow off. Maybe, you know, possibly this is the start of what would then be a shallowing off a bit. We would need, you know, a bigger screen or to put people much closer. But this is over, you know, sat at a normal different distance. This is over, you know, most of the area of a, uh, of a CRT display. So this is that first point that the summation that we have is extensive and, and that it isn't some sort of only short range thing. And thinking about it in terms of what would be happening in the brain, you know, this is obviously happening, you know, over quite a large number of neurons, if it's, you know, when it's happening in the brain. In terms of the second study, so this one is something that I've been meaning to get out and hopefully we'll get out relatively soon. Um, it's similar to the previous one that I just showed, but in this case here, we're showing these rectangular strips of grating instead. 
at different locations in the visual field. Um, so we can have them in the fovea. So if you're looking at the F, the ones in the fovea are right here. The ones in the parafovea are a little bit above the where you're looking. And the ones that are in the periphery, this would be called really the near periphery, are 10 degrees of visual angle above where you're looking. And this is to get to that second point about the summation obey, obeying the same rule um, across the central visual field. So we have some different sizes. This is our sort of smallest size here, where it's just one tiny little cycle of a sine wave grating. Um, and then our largest size is up here, which is 32 cycles wide and four cycles high. And we did it again, both without compensation and with this compensation applied. And so without compensation, we get uh, pretty much what we would expect. Um, I've plotted here the three participants separately. So we can just look at uh, one of them on the left um, here. So in at the fovea is what we have at the bottom for a smaller height and for a larger height. It's with the same model as the noisy energy model that was the best one for the previous study. Um, and so as the stimulus gets larger, um, so in this case, it's as the rectangle gets wider, um, we get the kind of summation with uh, increasing area that we expect. And it's um, fit by the model well in the fovea and in the paraphobia up here. And then in the periphery, it's a little bit less good. Some of it is not explained. This region up here is not explained. The difference in the overall sort of global offset is because when we were mapping out the visual field, we didn't actually map out that far. Um, and so we just sort of extrapolated our map. And this difference between this dashed line and this solid line is sort of a, is a correction for, for where we think our extrapolation was off. Um, it's even, it's worse for the middle participant here. You can see that we greatly um, uh, underestimated how sensitive they would be. And so we had a second parameter that just moves it down. I say greatly, I mean, it's off by a factor of less than a factor of two, but um, it's still, I mean, a factor of two is quite large. Um, so we have this extra sort of fiddle parameter that, for the fact that we are extrapolating our maps. Um, and then for third individual, we didn't actually measure the periphery anyway. So this behavior also follows our model, but we're more interested in what happens when we look at the compensated stimuli. Unfortunately, the effect of doing the compensation is all of the data gets slapped on top of each other. And so it becomes really hard to interpret. So these light gray data are what we had previously before we compensated. And now all of the locations, fovea, paraphobia, and periphery are all stacked on top of each other. So you can't see what's going on. Um, so I divided it out into these individual little subplots. And what we see here is that um, basically at all the different locations, the, the same model, which is this fourth root summation, which is say in our, in our argument, it's this noisy energy summation, linear transduction, followed by the application of a template. Um, it explains behavior in the fovea, in the paraphobia, and in the periphery. Um, the only cases where it seems to have trouble are for our very small uh, stimuli in the periphery for this participant, where they're worse than they should be. And in this participant in the paraphobia, they're a little bit better than they should be. And so these are two things that um, we don't have explanations for, except for making sort of special arguments about why, you know, in this case, you know, to say that they were unsure about where the target was because it was so small and it was in their peripheral vision. And in this case, maybe that the receptive fields become larger with, with eccentricity, but without resorting to some sort of, you know, special pleading, we don't get an explanation for these. But the important thing is that in all of the other cases, things behave very well and they are well accounted for by the model. Uh, people happy with that? Maybe... Yeah, go ahead. So what would happen if instead of three human participants, you repeated this entire thing with like a large cohort of aphobia and animals like rats? I have no idea. I mean, the one thing is you, they would have to be extremely patient Yeah. <laughs> because uh, collecting the data takes takes a while. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know whether, so I mean, in this case, we're talking about whether you would be able to, uh, whether there would be a need in that case to measure the maps, I guess. Probably not if it's just in their central visual field. I don't know about 
what what comes out in terms of spatial summation in animals um i say yeah i wouldn't know sure. it would be interesting to find out <laughs> yeah it also take like 10 years to collect the data but... <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean the good thing is it's contrast detection so i i mean that's a task that an animal you know obviously can easily learn how to do yeah. um which is that's that's the good side um but yeah it's something that i don't have uh, knowledge of Okay, so for the, the final thing that I uh, promised I was going to put forward the case for um, is that it is actually a combination and addition of the signals rather than probability summation. So for the two results I showed so far, the models that accounted for them both had this underlying fourth root summation. Um, and it was implemented in those models by a nonlinear squaring transducer and a template. But if we had probability summation with an exponent of one, so, so with a linear response to contrast, um, we would still be able to get those slopes. So the question then is, in the, on that basis, what leads us to prefer a noisy energy model over probability summation with, a, with an M of one? And there are two sources of evidence for this. Um, the first one comes from experiments with these sorts of holy stimuli. So here's an example in the bottom right here. These are called the Battenberg stimuli after the Battenberg cake that we have in England. And I don't know whether there are many other places that's made up of squares inside. There's also, um, I meant to put a picture on, but I, but I forgot. There are the Swiss cheese stimuli, which are the same thing, but they are circular and they have circular holes in them. And the idea is that with these stimuli that have holes in, um, what works out quite well for us is it seems like this template process where you're able to match a template to the stimulus and ignore the irrelevant bits. Uh, it doesn't seem to work if the stimulus has holes in it. It doesn't also remove the holes. So if it's a Swiss cheese, a round Swiss cheese with round holes in it, you match the outside, the sort of extent of it, but the bits that are inside, you're integrating still the noise from the holes. Or from the Battenberg here, you integrate still the noise from these voids in between the, uh, the little grating parts. And what that means is that um, in probability summation, um, if you're summing over the whole thing, um, it's always, it's all that matters is how much signal is there in the display. But for our model with a template, um, because the template sort of fails in this, it reverts to a quadratic summation model. So it's fourth root summation if you can match the template exactly. And if you're missing the fact that half of the signal in the middle has been removed your template still to the whole thing it becomes quadratic summation and this has been shown a few times the first time was when these batterberg stimuli were introduced it was also a condition in the 2015 paper that um, i showed just before and there have been a few other studies as well showing that stimuli with the um if you remove parts of it the template fails and you get more summation because in the case where you've removed half of the signal you're still including the same amount of noise The other source of evidence for there being a um, uh, uh, is really that there is a nonlinear transducer. Um, so evidence for there being a nonlinear transducer means that for probability summation, the um, the uh, slope would have to be an eighth root, which is too little summation. Um, and the evidence that we get for there being a nonlinear transducer is that the um, psychometric slopes, this is a different slope. This is the slope of the psychometric function that determines how quickly we go from guessing to that sort of asymptotic performance. That slope's consistent with there being a square law transduction of contrast. The prediction, if it's square law transduction of contrast is a, is a beta of 2.6. Basically, um, if it's linear, the viable beta will be 1.3 and it's just multiplied by whatever the, the transducer is. So if the transducer is two, then it predicts a beta of 2.6. And from this data, from that 2015 study, we find that it is pretty much exactly 2.6. Um, and so that aligns much nicely with them with the transducer model. So um, I'm including a little bit earlier. I think I spoke faster than I intended to. Um, but we have plenty of time for questions as a result. So my conclusion is that by measuring uh, summation, we can draw some simple inferences about how vision might work. Um, the models describe the data, I think, very well. Um, 
Obviously, we can, if we find conditions under which the models don't hold, they'll reveal what more complex features might be missing. Um, also, I mean, even though this is the model that works behaviorally for you know, psychophysical data, um, it doesn't mean this is how it actually has to be implemented. But what it does mean is that if this describes summation behavior and there is a you know, more elaborate sort of um, derived model about what this should be, I mean, it's essentially going to be approximating or, or, or simplifying down to the kind of thing that I've shown here. Um, because the kinds of uh, agreement that we're getting are such that you could probably assess a more complex model just by seeing whether it predicts these, this kind of uh, summation slope uh, without having to uh, get too much into the detail of you know, finding a data set to an, compare it to. Uh, and that's it. So thank you very much to you for listening, to QLS for asking me to give this talk. So obviously my collaborators, uh, Tim, who was actually my PhD supervisor, Fred, who's over with me at MVR, um, Gunnar, who was at MVR and is now at Plymouth in the UK, and thanks to my funding. Obviously, if you have any questions, I'm very interested to answer them. So it's like um, basically uh, with the, with the, this model that you showed, yeah, you showed like you know a number of different stages that perform a few calculations, and then then we have a probability outcome of you know identifying things correctly, what have you. Yeah. Can you can you like speculate as to you know the actual underlying neuroanatomy that performs some of these calculations you know there's a lot happening between like receptive fields optic tract lgn v1 v2 like all this stuff there's a lot of hardware doing yeah, yeah sure there. so the basically the, the idea is that um before the uh, nonlinear transduction um we, things are because we think that the limiting source of noise happens after the transduction and the things that are before that are kind of transparent yeah. Uh, in that, you know, we, we can't, th this kind of model and this kind of analysis doesn't get into what is happening before the transduction point. And the transduction we believe is happening in is the sort of V1 response, you right. know, and, and maybe that is not in terms of from a physiology point of view, I, I don't know where, uh, whether um, I'm going to be able to get away with saying that the response in, at the V1 level is that's the point of the nonlinear response. Um, obviously, at V1, we have the complex cell. So this kind of um, thing where we have, it's implemented as if it is a squaring of the sine and cosine components and then a combination into, a, um, into an energy. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is something that, that could be represented then in complex cells in V1, possibly. Um, and that then the additive noise is happening at, at that stage. Um, and beyond that, What's happening in higher areas, you know, we can't, we can only really speculate, um, except for, you know, doing studies looking at things across different orientations. So the fact that things are orientation tuned, for example, is what leads us to put the site as V1, because yeah. that's when we have orientation tuning. Right, because that's like what we know from people in real type of stuff. Yeah. So follow up question, are you then constantly on the hunt for, you know, exotic clinical populations that might have some <laughs> there's a lesion somewhere that you can rerun all this on. So I did this this kind of experiment in people with amblyopia, thinking, well, maybe we'll find something that's interesting about summation being different in amblyopia. Uh, the, the difficult part, I mean, the reason why that study never came out is that um, we're quite careful in the design of the stimuli to try and make it so that anything else that could make things more complicated in the way that we have to model it um, isn't useful for people to do the task, isn't reliable for people to do the task. And so if people are sort of operating and doing things in, in uh, a good, smart strategy, they'll only be using what we expect that they're going to be using in the model. Yeah. The problem in amblyopia for people that I tested was because their sensitivity was, was less um, to the stuff that we were looking for, they used other aspects of the task to do it that which we hadn't even considered. And they don't even know themselves. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. So all they're doing is they're getting feedback saying, I got it right, I got it wrong. Yeah. And then um, this is specifically a problem for the, um, we get to them, the, the Battenberg stimuli is what we use for it. So specifically a problem for these Battenberg stimuli. I mean, one way to look at this is that you are subtracting half of the, the grating information that's mm -hmm. there. So you have a, a vertical grating and we just deleted half of it in these chunks. The other thing that you're doing there, if you look at the, the Fourier transform of the stimulus is you're adding in a whole bunch of other Fourier components yeah. and uh, people with normal vision, they're not the most useful thing to do the task. So they don't use them. Yeah. People with amblyopia, they are 
the most useful thing to do the task if they can't see this writing. Sure thing. Yeah, I guess that's the tricky part of all this stuff. It's like, you know, probably desperately want to put a bunch of metal in somebody's brain, but nobody's going to let you. So. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you can do stuff with very smart stuff on summation with, um, uh, with EEG and you know, MRI, like they, there's been studies done. Uh, I can say it's very smart because I wasn't on them. There have been studies done with um, you know, frequency tagging the different components of patterns like these and looking at how they, uh, they sum together. And what we tend to find is consistent with what we expect mm -hmm. from the, the psychophysics. Cool. Thanks. One more question. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Um... <laughs> Curtis Baker. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay, so Curtis says a certain consensus spatial filter shape is assumed. How sensitive are the models to fits to fits to changes in this assumption? From the neurophysiology, we know V1 neurons vary quite a lot in respect to field shape, field shape, for example, in their orientation bandwidth. Um, it's something where I mean we've we looked at it in terms of uh, assuming a a single uh, uh, bandwidth. So the bandwidth. Obviously, in terms of receptive field, will determine its in the, what we're doing here because we're doing linear filtering. The bandwidth is going to determine the size of the uh, receptive fields that we're getting. Maybe as well. I mean, Curtis would probably also say that I won't put words in his mouth that that, that relationship maybe we don't want to necessarily have. Um, we've looked at varying the the bandwidths in the range from you know taking classic citations like uh, Devoloy and Devoloy. Of what kind of bandwidths they they find, and within that range, it doesn't cause a lot of damage. Maybe what would be more useful, and what we haven't done yet, is have a look and see what would happen if there were a range of bandwidths and a range of sizes, and they were all contributing. Because in the implementation we have now, it only supports one sort of uh, um, size of receptive field. Um, but obviously, in the actual uh, anatomy, what we have are a ver variety of different. Um, different ones. So um, yeah, that's something maybe we'll even look at it for the paper because it's not uh, submitted yet. Other questions? There's only so much intervention we can do right on a real human being. So, so um, how do you see this being translated? So uh, uh, translation, I mean, it's interesting because uh, some of the work that's done on this is done, um, the earlier work that was done on it was done by a team at um, NASA, uh, because, you know, one of the things that you might want to know is just what are the limits of human perception, and if you want to make something more or less visible, mm -hmm. you know, if I'm going to make it more visible by making it larger, how much of an improvement do I expect to make? So that's something where the mechanistic part of it, the actual understanding about why it's happening, you know, isn't as important. They just want to know in terms of for an application basis. If I make something bigger or smaller, how is that going to affect how uh, detectable it is? Um, in terms of uh, other, other things, I mean, from this, we can get to um, other sort of higher level kinds of summation. So um, the models that we use here, just in its summation of contrast over space, um, I've used equivalent models to look at summation of um, uh, texture for making an orientation judgment of something. So if you imagine, um, it's hard to think of an uh, actual ecologically plausible example, um, but if you have a, a field of many sort of oriented elements, so if you spill like a bag of rice on the floor and it might be all randomly oriented, or you might somehow shake it in a way to make it, you know, um, uh, more in one orientation than another. Those Iron sorts of... Filings. Hmm? Iron filings. Iron filings, that would be a good one. <laughs> so the, the, these judgments about what's the global orientation of something, or I mean, you know, actually a much better example, though I haven't uh, worked on this problem is the global orientation of the things. Those sorts of global orientation judgments. You can look at summation in those kinds of slightly higher level tasks using quite similar models. Um, obviously, you have a, a, a layer of extracting the orientations or the motions of the individual parts and seeing how they contribute to the global percept of what's happening in, in the whole. Um, you know, um, yeah, it, it's. What, what I think, I mean, one of the things that I think that we could get to from that level of understanding is um, when we're looking at information visualization, what kind of information visualization do you want to do to exploit 
the kind of processes that we think we're identifying. So if we identify that people are actually doing a certain kind of operation with their vision and they're doing it effortlessly in parallel, sort of automatically with no, you know, with no training required, if we understand how the simple early stage of the vision work in that way, and we want to visualize some information that's not, you know, just you know, an image, yeah. uh, that's not just a picture of something, then maybe we can use an understanding to exploit the visual computation to make some sort of data more interpretable. That's that's what I would like to get to with it. Yeah. I was wondering if you redo this experiment with any clients of the same person, do they improve at all? Um, so the the actual improvements in performance on these kinds of tasks we do see over like the first few hours. Um, for if we read it, this whole experiment again, or one of these whole experiments again, the people who are in it are already so well practiced. I wouldn't expect uh, that they could could get any better because it takes hours and hours and hours. And so we just do all of the conditions in a completely random order, so that any if there is any small improvement, it's sort of distributed, and we don't you know have all of the improvement happening in one of the conditions. Um, one thing that's interesting about the idea of doing it again is that these uh, maps of sensitivity, I'm trying to get back too quickly, and though it's being a bit slow. So these kinds of maps of sensitivity across the visual field, um, I'm getting back interested in now because we never quite understood why they have the shape that they have. And so this one was measured um, from, I think from me, like 10 years ago or 11, 12 years ago. And so I would be interested to see if I measure this again now, whether it's the same or whether it actually changes over, over time. Um, and so uh, in that case, maybe I will be redoing some of this stuff 10 years on. Yep. I just have a flip of my earlier question, I guess. Have you, uh, I'm sure that you've done these tests with a lot of different subjects a lot of times. Have you ever seen either a neurotypical individual perform surprisingly well? Or conversely, let's say, you know, somebody with some kind of autism spectrum disorder perform, you know, atypically well on this kind of thing. Because, you know, we've all seen like the, the video of like, let's say you fly the guy over the city and then like, they redraw the whole thing from memory and you're like blown away mm -hmm. by the way that this person can retain all this visual information. I and mean, that's a memory thing, but yeah, you know, same, same. Uh, so in terms of uh, specific advantages in autism, I don't know about anything for summation. I know that there are kind of low level tests, tasks like these where there are supposed to be um, uh, maybe differences, possibly I think some of the differences are supposed to be advantages. One of my uh, co-authors on this paper, actually uh, Daniel Baker has done work looking at that. And I, I don't remember whether he was looking at it saying that he found something or whether he was debunking something that somebody else ha had possibly found. Um, in terms of between individuals, there are sort of overall individual differences and some people are just better, like have better contrast sensitivity than others, like a global shift. But um, what's interesting about the uh, summation results that we get, um, and this is consistent, you know, looking over the different studies as well, is that um, in this case here, we have three individuals. I mean, we're all, you know, in the same lab together, you know, from similar backgrounds, but, um, and so we all, we all here showed sort of similar um, summation. Mm -hmm. um, and in the previous studies as well, there are some outlier studies with like showing huge differences, which I think are due to and artifacts, but there isn't a sense that this summation is something that varies very much. So, I mean, maybe it's, the thing is the studies as we typically want to do them take a long time to collect the data so what it would need really is a um, paradigm or a protocol to measure one of these kinds of things very quickly mm -hmm. and then you could go out and you could make a quick measurement um, that's one of the things i'm interested in doing now that i have been doing is developing experiments maybe not quite like this but this could be one that run on um, tablets like um, don't use an iPad but because uh, it's terrible but on an Android tablet um, uh, you can take you can code up an experiment like this and you can bring it and you can give it to somebody you can take it somewhere and you can have people do an experiment on a on a tablet mm -hmm. a shortened version of one and get something um, the reason why I haven't typically done that is what we like what we liked doing at least at my old lab, is collecting a lot of data on a few individuals and having models that like really like perfectly go through them. When you're collecting from a hundred people, you're going to have really noisy data that are roughly, yeah. you know, in line with a with a model, which is sort of a different uh, philosophy. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, I hope you guys stock up on orange juice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ooh. 
Thank you very much. Alex, Thank you for a wonderful presentation and uh, yeah, some really groundbreaking results there. So um, come and talk to us again in a few years' time, and we'll we'll see the uh, developments. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Cheers. you. Yeah. Bye bye.